everyone, and welcome back to the second episode of the Leveled Up Podcast. I'm Nick, one of your hosts. And I'm Ash, the other one. Yeah. All right, Ash, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? That's all right. We had a, we had a pretty good first week for the first episode. <laughs> pretty exciting. Yeah. I'm uh, excited. Wanted to thank everyone for the interest that we've seen so far. Uh, we really appreciate it on our on our pilot episode. Yeah, it's really it sweet. It was. Um, and Enter the Gungeon was was a fantastic yeah, game. That was to, an easy one. I know, right? To to open it up with. Now we're gonna get a little, a little harder. Yeah. Yeah. How come? I don't know. I think this next game is going to be a little hard for me to finish. Yeah, that's right. Um, and we've actually had a couple people uh, recommend uh, and ask for games that they want to hear about on the podcast. So if there's anything that you guys want to hear us talk about or want to learn more about, just leave a comment down below um, and we will see if we can get to it. Uh, but this week on this episode, we are going to be talking about another game that is very near and dear to my heart, which will probably be a recurring theme forever. Uh, <laughs> what What is the game this week? Uh, this week we are playing, I'm pretty sure, the first game that came out on the Nintendo Switch. Yes, unless you count 1-2 Switch, which was kind of the party game that came out. But... What do you mean? That's what we're doing. Right. All right. <laughs> that's, that's... My, all my notes are wrong then. <laughs> right, because I thought we were doing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Oh, sh I played the wrong game then. Uh, okay, all right, redo, cut. We'll cut here, okay? <laughs> No, no, for real though. We we are playing uh, Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, yes, sir. Uh, which was one of the big launch titles yeah. uh, with the Switch, and I'm very excited. So after after our first episode, um, we were talking about more games to play, and we've actually uh, played quite a few games since then that we're going mm -hmm. to talk about. We have a little bit of a backlog. However, one of the ones that we immediately wanted to jump to recording footage for was Breath of the Wild, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really wanted to do it because everyone you ask, you, you know, you say, "What's the game I need to play on the Switch?" Almost everyone I see says Breath of the Wild, and I've we're gonna talk about it later. I, I've never played a Zelda game. No, you haven't, um, which is crazy. But I mean, I've seen Nick. I watched Nick play this game. I mean, I think that's also gonna be a recurring theme. I've seen Nick play a lot of games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you have. I mean, it's it's breathtaking. Once again, I think also here's another theme. I didn't think I'd ever play it. No, <laughs> that's true, but. Uh, it was it was good. You know, I think yeah. it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to watch you play it. But why don't we jump into it? All, All right. right. First up, what is Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild? All right. It's one of, I couldn't tell you how many Zelda games. A lot, actually. I don't know the answer to that either. It's hmm. quite a Big lot of Zelda fan. games. Um, Action adventure game. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's an RPG. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the only key tag you're missing there is open world. Ah, yes, that's uh, the key yes. Tag. <laughs> it's it's a game that came out as a launch title for the Switch. Uh, but as we know, and we'll talk about a little bit later, it was originally not intended to be for the Switch. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually supposed to come out on the Wii U a lot earlier than it came <laughs> out on the Switch. Um, but due to some design decisions and setbacks, which we'll talk about towards the end of the podcast, uh, it got pushed to the Switch of March third. 2017. Wow. Uh, the day the Switch launched, uh, I was actually in line uh, at Best Buy. No way. Yes, uh, for a day one launch. I had not pre-ordered the Switch. Like you? a complete idiot. Yeah, I know. It was just, it was a lot of money at the time, and I had not put a pre-order down anywhere. What changed your mind? <sighs> I think the night before, there was so much hype about talking about this. I was like, I don't think I can just wait until... You know, uh, my, my birthday was a couple months after uh -huh. that. I didn't want to rationalize waiting a couple months after that. I wanted to be able to play the new Zelda game uh, day one because yeah. I'm a huge Legend of Zelda fan. Mm -hmm. So actually what we ended up doing, I remember this story quite clearly. We woke up and I started to frantically Google. It was at like eight or nine in the morning. Are you waking up that early? I know, only wow. for games, only for games. <laughs> um, and I started to search for places that might still be selling, you know, the Switch. Okay. This was actually before Toys R Us went out of business. Whoa. Um, so this was, or at least they had an opening store. Uh -huh. um, do you remember where it was? Yeah, it was by where REI is right yes, now. Yes, yeah. So I actually got uh, <laughs> my friend Merrick, uh, believe it or not, who also woke up that early. Uh, and we went out to see if we could find where uh, the Switch would be. So we drove to Toys R Us that said they were doing like first 10, like would get one. Oh, wow. Um, and there was already a line of like 30 plus people when we got there. So we stayed in line for a little bit, but we didn't think our chances were great. Someone came out and was like, hey, we don't have that many Switches. Like most of you probably won't get one. So we decided to ditch that line and we drove not too far across to Best Buy mm -hmm. at the time. 
And I remember Best Buy hadn't opened yet, but there was a huge line that started snaking outside of the doors. Wow. Um, however, when we went up and talked to an associate that was standing outside, they were like, we have plenty. Like, they have a ton of switches, all with the accessories. And we were like, perfect. So we stood in line. And sure enough, as soon as the doors opened, they had this, like, almost Wonder World kiosk-esque <laughs> of, like, a, a table for the game, a table for the Switch, accessories, gigabyte cart, it, like, wow. all sorts of different stuff, you know, because it's Best Buy. So they yeah. had, like, chargers and, and SD cards and all sorts of stuff, you know, next to the mm-hmm. Switch. So it was kind of like a what do you want to put in your shopping cart That's as so you walk cute. past, like a banquet. Yeah. Um, All-you-can-eat buffet. So I grabbed the Switch and I grabbed Breath of the Wild. Uh, and I mean, that was that I, I brought it back home. I honestly, I could have skipped class that day. Uh, that might've, that might've been what happened. I don't even remember if I had a class. I just remember getting home and playing breath of the wild for pretty much the rest of the day. Wow. I know a little bit of a tangential story there, but that was where I was when the game came out That's um, exciting. in the beginning, which was so exciting. It was such an amazing game to turn on and, and immediately just load up the Switch and, and jump right into. Um, well, here's my story. Yeah. I didn't even know the Switch was coming out. Right. Okay. I didn't even know it was a thing. All right. And I remember my friend Scarfo, he had pre-ordered one, was it one, two Switch? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was from, the other game. Um, Walmart. And he asked me to take him to go pick it up. Okay. That was it. That was it. I had, I had no idea there was a new console coming out. There you go. And here we are, here <laughs> talking we about that are. day, three three years later, three and a half years later. Whoa. I know, crazy, right? Mm. Um, so I thought first we could talk about first impressions. All right. Um, just for a little bit of the background, my first impressions when I, when I started playing it, I was blown away. Mm. You know, and I know we'll talk about it in just a minute that you hadn't played another Zelda title. My favorite Zelda game before this was Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Uh, which came out on the GameCube and then was remastered for HD on the Wii U, okay. um, which I actually played both versions. It was a really, really good game. And the thing I liked about that one is you could really just explore in this vast open world. You could uh, sail a little boat to many, many, many different islands, just explore to your heart's content. So as soon as I loaded up Breath of the Wild um, and you you exit that shrine of, of resurrection... Uh, and that first sweeping shot of the Great Plateau, I, my heart skips like several Aww. beats. I know. I just, y- you look out through the whole um, expanse of everything and you're like, oh my God, you see Death Mountain in the background, you can go there, right? Like it's it's just crazy. So when I started playing it, I, I started to expect a lot of the, the normal Zelda kind of um, tropes mm-hmm. uh, to be present, but they weren't there. And I remember I had quite a few friends kind of crowd around because I was one of the first people that got the Switch. So oh, that day, you. I know, yeah. right? Uh, we had a whole bunch of people that were watching and I put it up on the TV uh, and, and people came around and we were just mesmerized by by how well made this game was. Um, but from someone who hadn't played a Zelda game and playing it basically three and a half years after it had come out, <laughs> what did you think the first time? Because you're no stranger to the Switch. You actually played through Odyssey like as soon as you got your yeah, Switch, mm-hmm. which was fantastic. <laughs> um, but for your first Legend of Zelda game, and for this game in particular, what were your thoughts when, when you hear Zelda's voice, Link, you need to wake up, and like leaving that room, what, what were you thinking? I don't really know. I mean, it's it's a weird experience because I know I don't feel any sort of way compared to anyone who's played a Zelda game before. I had no idea. Well, that's why we're who, doing this. Well, yeah, I, know I had no idea who Zelda was. I, I didn't know who was talking to me. I don't know. Oh, I just knew there was a voice talking to me, and apparently I woke up from something. That's that's the gist of what I got. But, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's completely beautiful. I mean, there's nothing... It, it makes you feel like you're really in the world, which is, you know, really crazy to think about. And I, I say this all the time, and I feel really bad about it. I do play games a lot for the way they look. I love when things are captivating like when it catches my eyes i'm here for it and the amount of detail that went into that game well no wonder it was delayed four years yeah um yeah so so when you when you originally leave the shrine of resurrection yeah you hear well at first it's a mysterious voice but i mean if you watch the trailer or very quickly you figure out that it is just i mean the first question you asked me was is that zelda (laughs) is that zelda talking to me right now um and the game teaches you, I thought, mechanics quite well. Yes. Right? I mean, to the point where apparently I was going through the plateau and 
I didn't even know that was a whole tutorial. Yeah, I think that that was the craziest part. So just to finish the thing about the Shrine yeah. of Resurrection, uh, you kind of learn the controls very Yeah, I very mean, you quickly. wake up and it takes you through, I don't know if I'd want to say trials, but clearly you have to go up this wall to get out of the thing. You have to learn how to jump. You have to learn how to keep going. Um, I, I thought it mimicked link waking up after a hundred really years so yeah, well because he, he forgot he's, everything exactly he had no memory yeah he woke up with nothing but his little undies um yeah. and you know what i mean like he's groggy he doesn't really yeah. remember how to move and you as the player immediately get in that headspace mm -hmm. not only because you're like okay link usually doesn't talk in game so it's easy for me to connect with this character but i mean all of the controls that you're learning the character is also learning so immediately you're in those shoes which is exactly where the game wants you when you leave the shrine of resurrection and there's that sweeping shot you run out onto the great plateau the camera takes control and it pans over link standing on that cliffside which yeah. is just like still the the hd like cover shot to this day mm -hmm. is is that um great plateau scene but after that as we were uh kind of running through you started to go through a lot of the great plateau um, challenges, trials, you met the old man. Yeah. And I remember maybe like an hour in, we were talking and I said, yeah, I mean, just keep in mind, this is just the tutorial. Like you're gonna have so much more to do as soon as you're done with it. And you looked at me, what did you say? What? <laughs> <laughs> you were- it's Basically what? You were astonished. Yeah, I couldn't believe it because, well, one, you don't realize after you get out of the shrine that you're in some sort of like, closed space in a way yeah right that there's a limit to what i can do at the moment but because like it's so open world even in the tutorial which is you don't find every day no uh i, I was blown away yeah. plus you're learning so many new skills yep that you're like oh okay this is the fifth skill i learned this must be the cap you know oh wait nope there's another one maybe this is the cap and it just keeps going keeps going and i mean we've played I think it's what it's I've played over eight hours so far mm -hmm. and I keep thinking when's the cap and I know you've told me a million times there is no cap yeah. basically until you finish um but yeah yeah uh and I think that's a beautiful thing that the game does very well is is being able to kind of throw you through this tutorialized section that doesn't feel like a tutorial mm -hmm. but you clearly know when you're done because when you got the glider yeah. and you left you were like oh my god and the world just completely opened yeah. up but we will get to that in just a second I feel like for our viewers, for those of them that have not maybe played a Zelda game okay. before, um, this is your first Zelda game. Yes. So I just wanted to take a minute and talk about Zelda games in general okay. and give people kind Go of a synopsis. It. So most of the Legend of Zelda games are action RPG style games. Very few of them are actually open world, like Breath of the Wild. Open world is just a genre tag that you can slap on a game uh, when you have kind of a vast quote unquote open world where you can explore anything at any pace, right? If you look at Mario games, they're not generally open world because they're level based, right? You go through level one, one, then one, two, then one, three, then the castle. You know what I mean? It's it's in a linear order. Um, games like The Witcher is very open world, you know, Breath of the Wild open world because you get plopped in a situation where the game guides you like to the places you're quote unquote supposed to go but you really can explore and do whatever you want. You know, it's just kind of up to your discretion mm -hmm. and the whole world is there. It's not really, or most of it is not gated by like uh, level 10 or cutscenes oh, yeah. that you have to get through. It's just, okay, I want to go here. I'm going to go here, you know? So that's kind of what open world means. Zelda games in general have always been very much about you play as a hero trying to save a fantasy kingdom and a fantasy princess who has been stolen away by a timeless evil. So you as the hero have to go through, um, clear a whole bunch of dungeons, uh, learn how to use a bunch of magical items left to you by, you know, teachers and, and sages of the bygone age, um, eventually overcoming the challenges that the, the demon king has placed before you, reaching his final layer, defeating him, saving the princess and saving the world in general. It's kind of your stereotypical hero's journey, right? Where you, you start, you go through the whole thing, and, and you start, end where you started. Mm -hmm. um, however, Zelda games differ in the way that they're played quite a bit. Um, almost all of them so far have been dungeon crawling. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked about that with Enter the Gungeon in our last episode, um, but that basically means you, you kind of start, you have a little bit of a world to explore, then 
the game is kind of separated into dungeons. So you reach a main story point, you go through like the fire dungeon where everything is themed with fire and you have mm -hmm. to get different items and beat fire enemies. And as soon as you beat that dungeon, you're now like one fourth through the game. You know, that's kind of like a big checkpoint, which is how a lot of Zelda games were played. Um, they also had a lot to do with Link, the hero in all of the games, finding very specific items. Um, so actually in a lot of the other games like Wind Waker, Ocarina of Time is a huge one. You go through the game and get very special items like the boomerang, uh, the bow and arrow, the claw shot, the hook shot. Uh, these are items that are gifted to you in dungeons, in chests, or by other NPCs. Mm -hmm. You use these to solve puzzles um, throughout the dungeons and throughout the game. And Legend of Zelda is a huge, huge proponent for puzzle solving in video games. A lot of modern day, like, classic puzzles stem back to the original Legend of Zelda stuff, like the lighting of the torches. If there's a couple torches that are out in a room, came from some of the original Zelda games wow. where you had to you had to shoot unlit torches with uh -huh. fire arrows to actually light them to reveal secrets. Um, so Zelda was all about that, getting the right tool for the job, um, going through the dungeon with it, mastering it, and clearing it, and then just kind of progressing through that. Breath of the Wild is really a breath of fresh air uh, when it comes to the whole franchise. And Anuma said this, who was, who was the uh, director for this game, um, IG Anuma. He said that when he wanted to create Breath of the Wild, he wanted to stray away from a lot of the series conventions, uh, primarily dungeons and um, item collection and things like that. So you'll have noticed while playing through Breath of the Wild, a lot of uh, the items are commonplace. You can pick up boomerangs anywhere. You can pick up a million different bows. Mm -hmm. Like you, I mean, you can speak more to this, but you you have quite an affinity for the bow so far. I do. I love, love bows. They're so fun to play and actually shoot with. And I really enjoy the controls. I would enjoy them a lot more if my controllers didn't drift. <laughs> um but it, it really mimics the feeling of shooting a bow and arrow. Yeah, right? Yeah. So in a lot of the old Zelda games, you didn't really have that. I mean, they were for puzzle solving, and you could use them outside of dungeons. I mean, classically, Zelda lets you do that. Um, but in this game, your key items are all of the items you start with. So yeah. the Sheikah Slate is basically a piece of technology you get. And in the Great Plateau, you get five runes, mm -hmm. right? That kind of help you solve puzzles through the rest of the game. Yeah. You're not searching through dungeons to to find the next like hook shot to get you to the next area. Everything you need is given to you right at the beginning of the yeah. game, right? Mm -hmm. You have the two different bombs, uh, which allow you to basically explode things in a various number of ways. You have Cryonis, uh, which is used to freeze water. Mm -hmm. um, you have Magnesis, which is used to manipulate metal objects. And you have Stasis, which is just used to freeze things in time, right? That's it. Those yeah. are all of your puzzle solving skills, more or less throughout the game. There's a lot of uh, nuance to them, um, and you do unlock different stuff later. But as for like old school items in Zelda game, this is all you got, you know? Which was a huge turning point in the Zelda series, because getting every item you need at the beginning of the game, and then just saying, how far can we take this now that players know how to use it, yeah. was crazy. You know, it was a complete turn on its head from the rest of the series. Um, so this being your first Zelda title, I mean, how do you feel about that? I like it a lot. I mean, obviously the first couple of shrines are a lot easier. I mean, you have to learn how to use all of your runes and things like that. But once you start finding shrines in, well, I'll just say in the wild. Yeah. Um, because every shrine is so different, and I'm assuming randomized. No. No? No. Don't listen to me, I guess. <laughs> they're all they're all very well, specifically designed. Okay. It's in the fact that like when you walk into one, you don't know what you're gonna have to do. Yeah. You don't exactly. know what you're gonna have to use or how you actually need or want to do it. I mean there was one that we did that um it was the what was the this time stopping one? Oh yeah. Uh where I was supposed to stop time on like a huge ball that was in my way did not catch on that and i just ran to the other side and threw a bomb arrow at it yeah and that was how i solved it i know i remember that yeah you were supposed to you were supposed to use stasis to yeah. freeze it get momentum to swing it over and then you were able to just shoot it with a bomb arrow instead yeah you know but i think we should freeze real quick we haven't actually talked about what shrines are ah good point what are shrines then? <laughs> so shrines are breath of the wild's equivalent kind of of dungeons yeah so speaking on to older zelda games to now 
Older Zelda games always had a very significant style of dungeon. You had the forest dungeon, everyone's favorite water dungeon from Ocarina of Time, which is legendary for being the worst dungeon in almost any video game ever, <laughs> unless you start to count Dark Souls and things. Um, but these aren't really dungeons in Breath of the Wild. They're more like trials, right? Yeah. Um, so they're, they can be called mini dungeons, I guess. They're these little uh, shrine-like entities that exist throughout the map. There's 120 of them. Um, you can go through, you, Link can go into them, and each one has basically a different puzzle that you yeah. have to solve using the runes that you got given at the start, or just your ingenuity. I guess so. <laughs> which is very, very cool. Um, so now speaking to your point, a very, very cool thing that we've actually talked about quite a bit um, is the shrines can be solved in so many ways, yeah. which again really differs from the series like line, mm -hmm. because almost always in a Zelda game, it's about logic puzzle solving. You get an item. How can I use this item to solve the puzzle? Okay, yeah. I have to do this, then this, then this. I figured it out. I solved the puzzle. Mm -hmm. In Breath of the Wild, the world is your oyster. Yeah. You can sit there and be like, okay, here's the logical way to solve the puzzle. I have to freeze the water so I can walk over it and jump to the next platform. Or you can say, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'm going to put a bomb down. I'm going to blow it up so I fly into the air and glide to the platform. You can solve it in so many different ways. Exactly. And what what was that like for you? Hard. Honestly, I like being told what to do. And I like a clear cut of this is how you have to complete something. Even though it frustrates me to no end. Um, but it's really fun when I don't realize what I'm doing. Or when I don't realize uh, it's the quote unquote not right way to do something. Right. Where it takes away the, oh my god, what does this game want me to do? And lets me be like, okay, Ashley, how do you truly think you need to solve it? Exactly. Yeah. It's really interesting. You step out of the game mechanics and like, yeah, okay, I guess a fire arrow would light a torch. Or you can be like, okay, legitimately in real life, lightning strikes metal. So I wonder if that would persist. Yeah. You know, you really have to mm -hmm. think about that. I think that's something you, I mean, you talk about all the time when I'm playing is that you can legit, like you do anything in the game just like you would do in real life. Yes. So one of the coolest design principles that uh, Anuma really wanted in the game is for people to be able to experiment, which nowadays in games is not a huge thing. In sandbox games, it is. Like if you look at something like Minecraft, the interaction between a lot of the different items and blocks is huge, or a lot of other sandbox type games. But in an action RPG um, like Breath of the Wild, to say, okay, what are some things that could happen in real life you know, what are players' natural instincts when they're faced with, with this kind of problem? Mm -hmm. um, for example, right, you, you have, you can have a lot of doors in Breath of the Wild that are, that can be opened in a multitude of different ways. For example, uh, some of them that are metal, uh, you can wait and like trigger switches and do as you would in a video game, or you can say, okay, these are metal, so I know I have a magnet rune, I'm just going to pull the metal with a magnet shove something inside of the door frame and then it won't close anymore right mm -hmm. like that's which you can 100 percent do and i think one of the coolest shrines which you have not gotten to yet Ooh. uh is the i don't remember which shrine it's called but it's the shrine where you have to create a chain of electricity from one point to the end which powers an elevator which takes you to the end of the shrine so what the game kind of wants you to do is take these little like electric cubes move them around with your magnesis to flow electricity between them However, if you're feeling particularly clever, you can just drop all of the metal weapons you're carrying and use those to conduct the electricity <laughs> instead. So if you have like a whole bunch of swords on you, you can just drop them on the ground, move them with magnesis into a chain, and the electricity just travels That's straight awesome. through all of the weapons, which was a pure stroke of genius on their part. Because I mean, you think about it like, yeah, you can solve it the way the game wants you to solve it, but I have other tools at my disposal, right? Mm -hmm. I have these metal objects, so why not try and use those? Yeah. Um, which is an absolutely super, super cool thing to talk about. But I think the the perfect segue there is to talk about what many people consider the downside of Breath of the Wild kind of evolving from the Zelda um, tropes mm -hmm. was the story. So I know you haven't encountered too much so far, but you've actually encountered uh, the brunt of it up front because most of the story is actually told up front in the okay. game. Um, and then it's told throughout the memories you find through the game. And then you have some cutscenes towards the end. But before I say my piece, uh, I want the viewers to know, and I, I would also like to know, what have you thought of the story so far, the storytelling? You know, what can you tell us about the story of the world? 
I really enjoyed it. I mean, I get the gist of it. You know, there's this... I would also, I'd like to say entity, but it's all I don't really know what it is. Calamity Ganon, mm -hmm. uh, who takes over Hyrule, mm -hmm. um, and that's like basically it. And then there are like these fighters that try to fight it. A hundred years later, here you are. Um, but what I really enjoyed about it is that because obviously you you as in Link, you lost all your memories, so you're just encountering these stories these people you're learning about what happened and in most games it's kind of like oh this is like a little flashback or someone in a storyline will be like oh you remember when you did this but this is like truly if you know nothing about what happened this that's what they tell you about which i enjoyed a lot because uh it just helps you take in that information a lot easier and you kind of start to understand, obviously, what happened. But then, like, you learn, you run into the old man. Find out the old man is uh, Zelda's dad. Mm -hmm. And then unlocks another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And then you run into um, Oompa? Impa. Impa, yeah. my bad. <laughs> uh, and she brings you into another piece of the puzzle. So while in a lot of other games, it's kind of a, a brute, brunt for. I can't speak. That's fine. <laughs> it's forced upon you in the very beginning of this is the storyline. Yep. Learn it. Or, you know, maybe you just, other stories, they don't even tell you what's happening. You kind of just have to figure it out yourself. But this is a kind of slowly learning the storyline along with slowly learning your skills, mm. which I find really interesting because the more people you talk to, the more you learn about your background the more they help you master your skills. Yeah. I, I actually, I really like that you said that. I think that was a really good way to put it. That's actually the argument that people gave why they didn't like the storytelling. <laughs> oh, okay. But no, no, I, I think you coming at it from someone who hasn't played a Zelda game before and actually enjoying that is really nice to hear. And I think a lot of people that maybe were on the fence or at least know the argument that exists uh, may be satisfied to know that there are people that that enjoy it for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll speak to it, I guess, in the Zelda sense first. In all of the other Zelda games, the story was very upfront. Okay. Um, not that there were many cutscenes. There, there weren't a ton of cutscenes in most of the, the Zelda games, but the story was pretty much what you were following the whole time. In games like Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, like you went from main quest point to main quest point with all people in between just telling you how the game is supposed to go. Um, even though there was bouts of exploring, it felt pretty linear. Uh, and even in uh, Wind Waker, which is my other favorite Zelda game, which was more open world, um, I mean, a lot of it was just being pressed by the story the entire time. Story beat to story beat to story beat. The interesting thing about Breath of the Wild is once you have those initial story beats of meeting King Rome for the first time, uh, talking to Impa, learning that you lost your memories, from then on out, the story is up to you, which people haven't really enjoyed. So the rest of the world building, like you said, comes from the characters you meet. Um, and something that I think you just learned at the end was you have to go and seek out your memories because you had just talked to, I think Pura is her yeah. name, uh, in the, the ancient lab. Um, in Hateno, and she restored all of the kind of images uh, that Link had in his Sheikah slate from a bygone age. Um, and Impa then tells you, hey, I bet if you go to these locations, your memories will trigger. Mm -hmm. That's a huge story point. So then it's completely up to you, but what people didn't really like is there's no order. There's no, yeah. hey, go to this town first, learn about what's going on in this town, and you also have a memory here, so this moves the story along. They just say there's 12 locations, explore the world. Personally, I loved that. I liked being able to create the story on my own and say, okay, I'm now faced with following the main story as I see fit. So I looked at all the pictures and I was like, wow, that jungle picture looks really cool. So I'm going to go see what life was like there and, and learn what I can about that section of the world. And it's very quiet. You know, there's not a lot of people throughout the game. I told you... Um, Hateno village like the main village you were just in is more or less one of the biggest villages in the entire game and it's minuscule compared to like towns in skyrim or other open world games you know it's it's crazy small so 
being able to to kind of craft the main story as you see, go to the memories in your own time. Uh, you also, of course, have to go to the four divine beasts, which are the actual like four big story points. Um, but you can do those in any order. Whereas most Zelda games <laughs> would say, okay, you have to go clear this one first, then this one to mm -hmm. learn more about the story. It keeps it entirely up to you. You still learn about the story, you learn about the history of the world, but the game says, look, if you want to go to the freezing north first, it may be a little more challenging, but go for it. You know, that's just what you can do. And I'll let you in on a little secret that I'm sure most of our viewers know. You don't actually have to even go to the Divine Beasts. The game tells you as a main quest that you should go there, but if you remember, at the same time, you get another main quest from Impa that just says, defeat Ganon. Um, she says, look... Go do these Define Beasts, because if you if you get them back on your side, they may help you in your final battle. Also, your overarching quest is to just go and defeat Ganon. If you so desire, you cannot visit a single Divine Beast and go straight for Ganon no in way. the center of the map. Yeah. Can you win? Uh, you can. There are speedrunners who can clear the game unbelievably quickly by jumping off of the Great Plateau, making it to the center of the castle, and defeating Ganon with some really dumb tactics. Um or clever use of game mechanics, uh -huh. <laughs> I shall say. Um, so a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people really thought that the story should be a little more hand-holding, and I understand, you know, because a lot of other... Uh, th the thing about open worlds is they tether you to the world by continuously telling you about the world, right? Yeah. Saying, look, this world is huge, and there's a lot of different races and creatures and monsters, but you don't have to feel overwhelmed because we're going to walk you through it step by step. Whereas Breath of the Wild is like, okay, here's your overarching stuff, you figure out everything for yourself, right? But it really is a breath of fresh air. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, like I said earlier, I really enjoy games that tell me what to do, mm -hmm. that tell me what step to make, when to go somewhere. And I think Breath of the Wild kind of hits my sweet spot where it's just enough information where I feel like it's telling me what I need to do and I need to go somewhere, but it's not forcing me to be like, oh, wait, actually, I see this really cool like alleyway down the way. Maybe I'll go check that out. And I don't feel bad, I guess, for right. checking it out. No, totally. And I think the difference that a lot of people have to remember when, when making this argument for the game is Breath of the Wild couldn't have told a story in another way. Or it wouldn't have been Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. Anuma wanted the game to feel new and exploratory. He said he really wanted players who were familiar with the Zelda franchise to almost just relax, to open up this game, not feel overwhelmed, and do things at their own pace. If the game had any other kind of story, which it could, it could have more cutscenes, it could point you in the right direction at all times and say this is the order you should clear everything, it wouldn't feel as open and exploratory as it does. And because of that, all of the other mechanics of the game are so much more heightened. The exploring aspect of the game, being able to climb up to super mm -hmm. high peaks, finding all of those towers which reveal parts of the map, if you knew the point that you had to go, or at least the general story being pushed, you know, yeah. from you, it just wouldn't feel as open. Which, you know, a lot of people don't like, and that's totally fair. You know, a, a lot of people need more of a tether to the world. Um, but I, I really appreciate how Anuma approached it and basically said, look, the story is going to be there. But what the game is really about is the players interacting with the world, not interacting with yeah. the story that we gave them, right? Mm -hmm. And I will say, you you are a special character because you are the kind of person that needs and wants to 100% a game. Like, you want to find all <laughs> the secrets. That is very true. You want to find everything hidden under anything in the game. And this is a game made for someone like you where, oh, let me pick up this random rock. Oh, and there's a... Korok. A Korok. Yeah. You know? Um, I'll tell you, it's also my worst nightmare because you know you that there are hundreds of thousands of things that you're never going to discover yeah. because, because of how I mean, how well you they're... just watched a video the other day that you had no idea. What was that? You told me that you had no idea there was this... Um... Oh, there it is. I don't oh, remember. Oh, uh, I was watching a video. Um, I think it was Nintendo Black Crisis, actually. Uh, he had made a video on the Zonai Ruins, um, which I may touch on in this podcast, we may not. Um, but one of the dragon statues uh, that you find in the, the fair in the jungle region actually had luminous stones oh, yeah. in its eyes. And I remember when I was watching that scene, I had to pause it and I was like, I have never seen gems in a statue's eyes. But sure enough, in the gameplay, there it is. Like you actually can go to these, it was just something little that I missed. 
that you know the game really tries to sneak yeah. in there it's so beautifully crafted uh -huh. um which i think is an even better segue to quickly talk about the interactions with the game so ash i want you to rapid fire okay. list off as many interactions that you can as link perform on the world just general things okay go for it uh i can break rocks <clears throat> i can cut down trees i cut grass that was fun i learned that recently i can mount a horse uh, I catch frogs, um, spear fish. Oh, you got me. Um, what about the boats? Boats. The raft. Oh, I haven't actually been on one, but uh, you can actually get on all the rafts and um, sail on the rafts, which is pretty cool. Um, the animals. This is gonna sound dumb, and I know, but, but they actually act like real animals. Mm -hmm. Like they'll run away if you walk too fast or things like that. Um, you lose stamina mm -hmm. and fall down things. Um, pick up rocks, like I said. Um, oh, you can uh, pick apples. Mm -hmm. Cook. That's one. Yeah. I mean, it's your favorite. One of your favorite mechanics. <laughs> True. Is cooking. Um, They're pretty much limitless, right? Yeah. And those are just some of the actually. Yeah, hey, I will say I only played for eight hours. No, so. yeah, <laughs> uh, those are some of the the first level interactions. Mm -hmm. The more you interact with the game, and I will honestly say the different types of arrows you get. Um, oh yeah. The more interactions you can perform on the world. For example, uh, when it starts raining, it becomes way harder oh, to climb. Oh my gosh! Yeah. That is probably one of the most frustrating things in the entire game. Or even the concept of when you go into a different um, environment. And your body feels the effects of that environment. The temperatures yep. and stuff like that, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember that Octo Rock you killed, the octopus, uh, uh -huh. towards the beginning. So he drops something called an Octo Balloon, which you can actually attach to anything in the game, and it makes it float. What? Yes. So this now unlocks hundreds of interactions of putting an Octo Balloon on an explosive barrel, letting it fly high up in the sky, luring an enemy, and popping the balloon. Yeah. That, like, the amount of stuff that you can do in the game, limitless. Mm -hmm. Those little slime blobs, choo-choos, that kind of run around, yep. their jelly is actually highly elemental. So if you strike it with a different type of arrow, it will turn into that element. So like an ice jelly or a fire what? jelly. Then strike it again, and it will explode in a burst of elemental damage. So if you set up a whole bunch of ice jelly shoot it, all the enemies around you will freeze solid into ice wow. cubes. Wow. Absolutely ridiculous, spoilers. right? Yeah, I know, total spoilers. I told you. <laughs> I told you there'd probably be spoilers <laughs> for this, but um, just, it's absolutely ridiculous, the amount of interactions that they put in this game. If you think that it may even be an option, it is an option. One of my favorites is you can actually uh, leave meat for several animals like dogs, and they what? they will eat it up and follow you around. Um, That's so cute. Which is I have super, to find super a dog cute. now. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just some of the interactions, but it really goes to show you the care and time that they put into this game yeah. because the world feels alive. It feels real when you have to sneak up on a bug or cut down some grass to get different ingredients for cooking. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, here's a great one, you actually uh, tried uh, attacking one of those mining stones, like a big crystal, with a sword when you first saw it. Yes. And you slashed at it maybe three or four times and you were like, am I supposed to be able to do something? It's sparkling. And next to it, I kind of hinted that there was a hammer. You picked it up, and the mine stone broke in one. Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that different materials have different breakabilities depending on what tool you're using. You That's can chop crazy. down a tree with an axe. You can cut down stones with a, a hammer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they thought of everything, right? They really did. Which I think is, is fantastic. Um, but speaking of weapons, I just wanted to get your opinion on the combat and controls. Because I know in the beginning... Even I thought it was really overwhelming. Like, they, they tell you how to switch bows, switch swords, yeah. shields. So what did you think? I think I lucked out by having you next to me for almost all of my <laughs> playing so far. Sure. In case I forgot something or I couldn't remember how to do something, you were there to help me. Um, I find it super interesting. Uh, whenever I play any game, I really gravitate towards the swords, the very close combat weapons okay in this game i absolutely adore a bow and arrow like i would prefer to fight that way and i do i mean i try to go yeah. out from the other side i headshot someone and we call it a day um super overwhelming to learn but i think you you take the grasp of it very quickly okay because you also 
So they teach you all of the basic combat mechanics yes. on the Great Plateau, the tutorial, uh, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, which is shooting a bow, uh, equipping different weapons, switching shields, switching arrows, switching bows, switching swords, dropping weapons, um, blocking with a shield. Mm -hmm. But it's not until later you actually can learn the perfect dodge. Yeah, which I, opens up a ooh, world of. I just actually, I recently learned that. I think within the last hour that I've played. Yep. Let me tell us. <laughs> gonna be a hard one to actually master it took me so long to get through that shrine yep that i don't know how i can do that in a battle on the fly but i guess at some point you'll I'll get figure used to it, it. Out. but not only there are so many more hidden skill mechanics that you oh, will I'm learn sure. with combat um which just makes the game so fun because from a new player perspective like you said you can just pick up every bow you see and headshot your way through the entire yeah. game at a level so much simple you know, so much simpler as you dig deeper, you get to level B and level C. You find out that you can parry. You can perfect dodge. You yeah. can do all of these crazy things that if you watch some people play it on YouTube, your mind is blown. Like some of the top Reddit posts on r slash Breath of the Wild are people just flipping over some of the harder enemies in the games called Lynels, slowing down time, like raining death from above. It's just <laughs> their, their mastery of the control is absolutely crazy. Mm. But uh, yeah, I, I just wanted your opinion on that because when we were playing together, it's a lot to take in. But... You picked it up pretty quickly, right? I thought so. Um, at least you kept saying that I did, so it made me feel a lot better. But I, I know you're biased, so. <laughs> so, speaking of uh, weapons and killing things, hunting things, sure. one of the biggest parts of this podcast I wanted to talk about is actually something that I learned relatively recently, even after having played the game for three years. Um, yeah, I didn't beat Breath of the Wild for a long time. I played a hundred and seventy ish hours of it um but i tried to a hundred percent most of what i could i did not get all of the korok seeds Ooh. i couldn't bring myself to do it <laughs> um but i was actually in a position to finish the game i had played the game for about a year and a half maybe two years and i just didn't want to finish it i have this thing where i don't like endings in anything yep. especially games um so I just kind of put it down. And eventually, I maybe like eight months ago or something. Yeah, it was this winter. Um, I finally picked it back up. And I was like, this game was perfect. Too perfect to not just finish. So I, I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned recently uh, something that the game does uh, almost invisibly that I wanted to poke your brain about. So I don't know if you've noticed yet, but some of the enemies have different colors when you're fighting them. Um, nope. On the Great Plateau... You have the red bokoblins. You know, oh, they're all red. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then as you leave, you might have noticed some of them are blue. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if you've gotten to the point in the game yet, but some of them can also be black. Nope. And then silver. Nope. Okay. So, I always thought this was tied to some kind of invisible, like, as you get further in the game, the enemies get harder. So the different colored ones have more health. Yeah. They can do more damage. They can wield different weapons, that kind of stuff, right? You'll notice that as you go farther and further from the center, you'll find those harder enemies, different okay. colored enemies, stuff like that. And I always thought, okay, well, maybe the game knows as you progress through the story, as you beat Divine Beasts, um, you know, the game just gets harder around you because it feels like the world starts evolving with you. You start to find stronger weapons in chests. But the weird part is if you go back to the beginning areas that you've already been to, all of the enemies there are also stronger. So that starts to make you think, okay, well, I guess it's not area-specific if all of the enemies start getting mm -hmm. stronger. So I learned recently in an excellent YouTube video by Croton on YouTube, there is a hidden XP system Whoa. in Breath of the Wild. So most RPGs uh, in general, uh, the way they kind of track your progression is whenever you kill things, you get XP or experience, right? Um, you, those experience points eventually make you level up. Skyrim's a great example of this. Uh, you can get experience points in a whole bunch of different things like pickpocketing, sneaking, uh, and you can level those individual skills up. However, something that was substantially lacking in Breath of the Wild, but almost all Nintendo games anyway, uh, is kind of a level up skill system. Um, that just, you know, it, it was never present in any of the other Zelda games, uh, so why would it be present here? However, uh, due to data mining, and I will uh, mm -hmm. put the, the video in that little i card in the top right if you guys want to go check it out. People found out that there is actually a tracked XP system in Breath of the Wild. And it is really complicated, and I would recommend you just go watch the video to figure it out. But basically, it boils down to 
each enemy you kill does give Link an amount of XP. Mm. It just doesn't show it anywhere. There's no XP bar. There's no way to actually tell. You just, you know, killing an enemy grants you X amount of XP. Once you have a certain amount, Link levels up, just like you would in any other RPG. As soon as Link reaches a certain level, all enemies start getting replaced with harder types. Okay. So the reason that they say in the video... Um, that you feel almost as if when you beat story points like Divine Beasts and stuff, the game gets harder is because clearing the bosses in the Divine Beasts actually give you like 300 XP points, which is a crazy uh -huh. amount, right? Uh -huh. um, however, the, the math and the way they do it is weird. Like once you kill a unique enemy, you can only kill 10 of them to get XP and then you don't get XP from killing them again, except certain enemies and you can get XP for killing other things that aren't enemies. Go and watch the video. It's super complex. I just thought that was incredibly interesting, the way they disguised that game design mechanic of, wow, the world is changing around me, I'm getting better, so the game's getting harder, even in places I've been. Well, that reason is because mm -hmm. there is actually a hidden XP in Level Up system. Cool. Right? Yeah. I just, I, I thought that that was a really, really cool thing no, to, yeah. to have in a game. Actually, really interesting. Something I wanted to bring up is, so I um, have a computer science and innovation major on my belt. I've, I've been a programmer for, let's say, seven, eight years of my life. Right. Something that I really thought about hard in this game is how in the hell did they program half the things they did? <laughs> and here's another example. If, I, clearly, I mean, actually, XP system pretty easy to implement. But the idea that everything is behind the scenes and that you don't show anything to the player. Genius. And, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it, it goes to the whole, like... Nintendo's always done this great thing of making things feel like an experience, like a closed-off experience, mm -hmm. right? You don't, you very rarely get to see between the cracks or yeah. behind the curtain uh -huh. in Nintendo games, right? Playing something like Mario Odyssey or Breath of the Wild, you there's an essence of magic of wow, like how did they do that? It's you know? Disney, right? Okay, yeah, it is <laughs> behind the corporate uh, curtain, maybe, <laughs> but. Um, so I don't know. I just I thought that was a, a real essence of magic that I thought was really cool in the game. Um, but before we wrap up here, I just also wanted to talk about uh, another very, very polarizing point of Breath of the Wild, and that was the music. Yeah. So, again, before I say my piece, what have you thought about the music so far? I don't know. I feel kind of biased because we've talked about this. Um, as everyone should know, Nick over here is an audio designer. <laughs> yes. Um, so music is very near and dear to his heart, yes. which is brought a new uh light in my life because I, I never paid too too much attention only except in one of my favorite games journey which we will definitely cover later in the series uh but it's something that you mentioned that i started to uh yes notice more is the concept of or not even the concept the lack of music uh it, it truly is just audio effects of the world and that's what cre creates the you could say, I guess, the music, which is surreal, you know? It's like a bright autumn day. Like, what do you think of? Or, you know, birds chirping in the morning. It's truly taking the natural elements and turning it into its own music, its own soundtrack, which is phenomenal. I couldn't have said it any better myself. That is 100% accurate. Um Something that they really wanted to do when they were talking about the uh, soundtrack is, once again, they wanted it to differ from Legend of Zelda because we did chat about this a little bit. All of the other Legend of Zelda games have s extremely recognizable music. The boss themes, the dungeon themes. Like, if, if I heard anything from Ocarina or Wind Waker right now, I could name the track and where it played in the game. You know, it's, it's just incredible music that really keeps you in tune with the game. And yet, Breath of the Wild doesn't have these sweeping themes that make you remember an area. But like you said, it's almost as if the nature around you is making the music. There are little stingers, little little hints of music that do come through. And there are themes throughout the game, mm -hmm. but almost everything is played on a piano, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the themes that uh, will start to give you anxiety, as it has given many veteran players anxiety, is the Guardian theme, which yeah. is this disgruntled bit of piano where it just almost sounds like completely dissonant notes as if someone's just plucking different keys on the piano just in a seemingly random order but the second you hear that do -da -do 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 -do, you know a guardian has woken up around you and has started to, to trace you which is one of the scariest moments yeah. in breath of the wild right um the horse riding music as well it's very faint very soft 
just a very like you know like while you're going throughout the game um and then of course the cooking music right the the kind of little cooking stinger that, that plays as well it's so subtle but it fits in with the theme yeah. of the game of just breath of fresh air naturalness you know that that nature around you which is very cool although i will say i really have missed the sweeping themes from all of the other legend of zelda games mm. because they are just so memorable you know listening to the to legend of zelda 25th anniversary um like soundtrack is just absolutely incredible to hear what all of the music has has gone through through all of the years it's so well orchestrated um and then the lack thereof in breath of the wild although all of the themes that do exist are pretty much just remixed or retextured older themes That's from awesome. from different legend of zelda mm -hmm. games and stuff like that for example king rome's theme uh, when he does reveal himself from the old man as the king um you can hear a piano kind of play in the background which is a sped up in slightly different version of the original castle theme from legend of zelda or legend of zelda 2 i think it was um which is super super cool right it's it's a throwback to the fact that he is the king of the castle uh because that is the castle theme so subtle and unless you're really looking for it you know you wouldn't hear that it was there but i think they did a really beautiful job with the way that yeah. it sounds speaking of which why don't we actually talk about the game in general and it's it's time that it took right yeah i actually just learned this we'll say maybe two hours ago yes um i had actually never watched the original trailer okay or teaser of breath of the wild right so i was telling nick that i wanted to see it and i wanted to actually you know watch it before we started this because i wanted to know what most players i'll say have seen before me right and that's when I, I saw, I mean, the original trailer came out in 2016. Yep. But the teaser well, came the out. Well, the E3 trailer. Did, yes. yes. The, the E3 teaser came out in 2013. 2014. 2014. And like Nick said earlier, this game didn't come out until 2017. I mean, that's four years. Yep. And mind you, when the teaser came out, it said it was going to be released in 2015. Yep. So... The, the life cycle of this, you're 100% right. Uh, Anuma actually teased the game for the Wii U platform back yeah. in 2013, which means it must have been in development before that, you yeah, know? Uh -huh. So it's at least four plus years at this point um, during uh, a Nintendo Direct, uh, which had kind of the first uh, teaser. Um, then uh, a trailer was present at the E3 2014 uh, press event. It was, like you said, planned for release in 2015 on the Wii U, However, it was delayed early in the year, uh, and they showed nothing at E3. Um, and then uh, it was delayed again in 2016, actually due to problems with its physics engine. They Whoa. said that it wasn't quite refined. So then, uh, finally, uh, they let people play the Wii U version at 2016. They announced the subtitle being it called Breath of the Wild. Um, and then finally announced it for the Switch uh, in January 2017. So just... Yeah, what, three, three months, months before the game actually came out on the Switch. Oh, silly Nintendo. They were like, here's the Switch. Breath of the Wild should just be a launch title for it. But they did also release it on the Wii U, like they had originally planned. Mm. So it came out on both platforms. Although four plus years of development and being pushed back, I think every minute was worth it. Don't you love being a game developer? So much. All right, Nick, right before we wrap up, I have a question for you. Yeah. Now, this is going to be a hard one. What is your utmost favorite aspect of this game? Topping everything. Um, why should other people play it? Why should other people play it? Definitely because you can cook. Um, I think that is probably my favorite feature in almost any video game. I think you know true. me by now. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I love a good <laughs> cooking session. I, I love the idea of going out, gathering some strange fantasy ingredients, throwing them in a pot back home, and making something useful about it, right? Yeah. Um, in all actuality, I think the exploration in this game felt new. It felt like no other game I'd ever played when it came to exploration. If you really want to get lost in a world that is seemingly ancient, natural, and and yet teeming with life, you know, this is the game for you. Exploring hours and hours on end, just living in this world. Um, but no, 100% the cooking uh, is, is super, <laughs> super fun. Um, I thought that, what a great mechanic to throw in there. Like, they had me sold on the game. And then the second I found out that you could just throw random ingredients into a pot, 
and make dishes that actually accentuated like your skills like oh now i can resist cold or now i can run a lot quicker that was it you know yeah. I, I spent hours upon hours just cooking dish after dish so much fun in that game awesome um but that is pretty much breath of the wild in a nutshell uh as a final closing note they are coming out with a sequel oh yeah and a prequel and a prequel at the time that this podcast uh is being recorded uh they recently just announced um legend of zelda age of calamity which is a hyrule warriors style game uh, which, long story short, is basically uh, based on the Warrior series, which is a type of game where you, it's one versus 1,000 gameplay. Basically, you play as a hero and fight hordes and hordes and hordes of enemies at the same time as they attack your keeps and castles, and you have to command commanders and stuff like that. Um, I have the original Hyrule Warriors, hundreds of hours into it. I absolutely adored it. So the fact that they're taking this game, making a prequel to it, um, in a Hyrule Warriors fashion, I'm very excited for also extremely excited for the sequel although we have very little information on that still someday someday um but when that comes out you know we'll be doing a podcast on that as well yeah i'm so excited to see what that's going to be like but until then uh i've been yeah. you've just been leveled up. up oh real quick i'll, yeah. I'll edit this in okay. somewhere or i'll just put it at the end all right how many times have you died so far maybe four four we have to have a death counter in these videos. So it's going to be four we're going to go with. Okay. That's what you think? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm going to go seven. Seven. Yeah. Okay. I'm definitely, after 170 hours, I think pushing on 40. Oh, I want to change my answer. Maybe 50 deaths. I'm going to say five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>